Welcome to Idea Collider, a regular podcast hosted by me, Mike Rea, uh, where I speak with the people who I regard as the most interesting within the pharmaceutical space, or I talk with the authors of the books that I've found most interesting on the subject of innovation. So, uh, enjoy. Welcome to uh, Idea Collider. Uh, this is a this is a, an episode that I've been trying to record for a few months, uh, and and delighted that we're finally here. Uh, delighted to welcome Kat Arni to the podcast to discuss the book Rebel Cell, which I um, so my background. So I studied genetics very badly at university. Uh, didn't understand everything I was doing then, and certainly wouldn't understand the world now. Um, and also enjoyed writing, and then realised that Kat is both a, a geneticist and a, uh, and a and a remarkable author. So, Kat, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Can you tell us a little bit more about you know how you got to the point of writing the book? You know your journey to to then. Yeah, so Rebel Cell, it's actually my third book. So my first book came out in 2016. It was called Herding Hemingway's Cats. And it was an exploration of, of how our genes work. You know, because my, my background is I, I trained as a scientist. I technically do have a PhD in developmental genetics. I worked in genomic imprinting and epigenetics before it was cool. So like, you know, the difficult first album um, I, I was in there. And, uh, and then I went into comms at Cancer Research UK and then brought my first book out because I wanted to sort of explore, like, you know, we hear about genes all the time in the media, that there are genes that make you fat, there are genes that give you cancer. And it's like, but how do they work? Um, turns out it's really complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I wrote that book. And then actually Rebel Cell um, is the book that I first wanted to write. So I've been wanting to write this book for a long time. Its subtitle is Cancer, Evolution and the Science of Life. And I've been wanting to write this book. I think it's probably been germinating since I was doing my PhD back in sort of the very early 2000s. And that's because I did my PhD at the Gurdon Institute in Cambridge. And back at the time, it was the Welcome Trust slash Cancer Research Campaign Institute for Developmental Biology and Cancer or something complicated like that. And it was a revolutionary place because it was bringing together developmental biologists and cancer researchers. And you're like, well, what have those two got to do with each other? And for me, as someone on the development side, you know, I was trying to figure out how do you go from one cell to a baby? You know, I was working at the very earliest stages of life. What happens when egg and sperm meet? How do you unpack this DNA that's coming from two completely different places, is marked in different ways, is packaged in different ways? You've got to put it together. The egg's got all this stuff going on in it. And you have to unfold this. You have to have cell divisions. You have to have cell specialization, differentiation, cells moving and grieving, doing all the things they're doing to make life unfold. And that has to work. And it works from one single set of DNA, one genome, and you unfold life. And on the floor below us were all the cancer researchers who were doing this same question, but asking what happens when you have one cell, one genome, one set of DNA, and it goes wrong. And it goes wrong in the most terrible, destructive, invasive, life-destroying way it can. You know, and I started to really see these things as two sides of the same coin. We have development unfolding life and we have cancer kind of unfolding death, if you want to see. It's like through the mirror on two sides of life. And so this idea like just bubbled away in my head and I, I couldn't understand why other people didn't see that these two things were really, really deeply interconnected, that it's just life. Cancer is not alien and separate to us. It's, it's a process of life gone awry. And, uh, you know, I spent 12 years at Cancer Research UK in the science comms team doing all sorts of stuff, working with the marketing team, press team, PR team, um, you know, sitting on the sofa at breakfast time, telling people how to understand the latest research. Uh, and all the time I had to learn about what's going on in the world of cancer research. And from the 12 years from 2004 to 2016, you know, as you'll know in the field, there's just this revolution. We went from a world where we were just finding individual hereditary cancer genes and, you know, sort of gene by gene to suddenly we've got GWAS, we've got genome sequencing, find all the genes, sequence all the things, develop all the targeted therapies. That's how we're going to cure cancer. And then at the end of my time there, this field really started to emerge of 
cancer evolution, tumor evolution. We started when we could have the tools to slice and dice tumors into tiny, tiny bits and see this patchwork of mutation within them. And I remember there was a paper from Charlie Swanton and his team that came out, I think it was 2014, um, the New England Journal of Medicine paper on kidney cancer evolution, and they got a tumor, cut it into bits, and you could draw this Darwinian evolutionary tree. And me and my colleague Henry kind of looked at each other in the office and like, oh, shit, this makes things really hard. Because suddenly you see that cancer is an evolving system and that we can't treat it just by firing like single targeted bullets at it because mm. that's just evolutionary pressure mm. and so all these ideas came together and um eventually kind of all all came into the book so so interesting and just to just loop back to Hemingway's cat because I didn't actually know that Key West was full of cats these days and I didn't <laughs> even realize that there was such a thing as a, was it a six-toed cat but, yeah, the Hemingway cats, yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't even know that was a thing until your book, and then someone mentioned that they've been to they've been there, and it's basically overwhelmed by cats now. So. Yeah, I mean, they, these are cats that basically have thumbs, and I think that's dangerous. Uh, so I, I think we should watch it in Florida. Florida's got a lot of problems, and the six-toed cats are one, for sure. Yeah, it's one of, the, one of the less spoken about ones. Yeah, um, <laughs> climate change, yeah, yeah six-toed cats, watch out. <laughs> Um, yeah, I know the, I, the thing that I love, I mean, apart from the way that it's written, and I think you are, um, you know, your success as a communicator is, is all the way through this book in terms of its accessibility, is that you have approached it with that mindset of it's a behavioral issue and, and, and it's a historical issue and it's actually a, a product of living that we've got you know, the, the cancer around and you've, you've answered a lot of the questions I always had was, you know, do wolves get cancer as much as dogs, for example? You know, can, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, the, you know, how the book begins and, and you know, what, you know, how the book flows? Yeah, so I, um, th there's quite a funny story to this. So originally I knew I always wanted to start with like the idea of the single cell. Because for me, it's like, this is the big question. How do you go from one cell to many, whether it's in development or it's in cancer? Mm. And I had this really clever idea that I was going to number the chapters, like chapter one, mm. two, four, eight, 16, 32. And I was like, I'm going to do this. And there was like hundreds, millions. And my editor was like, this is really confusing. You can't do this. So, um, so I wasn't allowed to do that. Uh, oh, um, but that was the idea yeah. that... I wanted this book to unfold on the journey yeah. from one cell to many and, and our understanding unfolding from, you know, it, mm. it's just about cell proliferation through to it's about evolution and interaction and how these cells are interacting in the environment mm. of the body. Because evolution isn't, isn't genes. It's like mm. how genes interact with the environment. Yeah. Um, so the book really starts with this concept of if you have multicellularity, you have cancer. And wherever pretty much we find multicellular life, we have cancer. And the, the paper that blew my mind was um, one that came out from some, um, I think the Hungarian scientists a few years ago, that showed naturally occurring tumors in an organism called a hydra. Now, a hydra is basically a tube with tentacles on the end of it. It's got three types of cells. It's an incredibly simple organism. And one type of those cells, they found tumors. And, you know, this wasn't because they put funny chemicals in the water or done any genetic manipulation. This is just naturally, spontaneously generating tumors. And, you know, absolutely blew my mind when I started looking more widely across life, because we kind of fall into the habit of thinking, well, cancer's, you know, it's mostly a human disease, right? And my, my first dog died of cancer. So I'm like, well, I know that dogs can get cancer, fine. But when you realize the breadth of animal life where we have described cancers. And that does include all the ones like naked mole rats and sharks where people are like, oh, they don't get cancer. It's like, yes, they do. Um, there's a book, it's a fantastic book called uh, The Ecology and Evolution of Cancer. It's edited by a researcher called Beata Ujvari. And there's like a whole chapter just listing all the species, you know, warthogs, aardwolves, birds, ducks, tortoises, reptiles, everything. Um, there's a couple of notable exceptions, actually. So comb jellyfish don't seem to get cancer. And that's really interesting because I saw a paper recently where I think they're just on a very odd branch. They branched out right at the bottom of um, an evolutionary kind of tree. So I think they might be a bit weird. And then also sponges. 
uh, there's a guy in Arizona called Carlo Maley, who is basically like nuking sponges with as you know many times more radiation than would kill a human. And the sponges are fine, they don't get cancer. And it's like, okay, there's something, something interesting going on there. So um, so yeah, that and that is fascinating. And and of course, it's not just across life that tells us that it's deeply evolutionary rooted in history. And we find wherever we find um, fossils, we can find evidence of cancer in, in human populations, in dinosaurs. Uh, the week my book came out last year in the UK, there was something like a 70 million year old osteosarcoma described in a dinosaur bone. I was like, ah, oh, nuts, just missed putting it in the book. But um, yeah. it kind of proves the point yeah. that this is a deep and ancient disease. And wherever we find multicellularity, we find cancer because as the title suggests, rebel cell. This is because multicellular organisms have rules. Our cells have to behave in a society to keep us healthy and functioning. Every cell's got to have a job. Every cell has to not consume too much, has to clean up after itself, do the job it's meant to do, not proliferate more than it should, die when it's meant to. And some cells can work out that they can prosper by cheating against these rules and, and you know, it's changes in their genome that enable them to cheat. It gives them the properties of excessive proliferation or this kind of thing, gives them an advantage. And then we're into sort of a process of evolution where they can cheat and, um, and start to kind of win in the society that they're in. Yeah, and that was, and that was so interesting, that, just that perspective that it's almost a sort of tragedy of the commons uh, you know, issue uh, with cheats and rebels doing what is good for them, but isn't good for uh, everyone. And I remember Clifton Leaf's book, uh, The sort of Truth in Small Doses, talking about cancer as, you know, maybe we should call it cancering, you know, as, as a verb instead of as a noun, that, you know, because one expression tends to lead to you misunderstanding it as a, you know, as an alien to be cut out instead of a process that's gone wrong. Yeah, that, that was another thing that really, really blew my mind and, and kind of made it feel very personal was, discovering the work of people at the Sanger Institute, people like Phil Jones, Inigo Martin Carena, and that work where now we have the tools to do genetic genomic analysis in depth on tiny, tiny samples. Um, you know, their famous paper where they took eyelid skin, um, this is like discarded from a cosmetic procedure, cut it into tiny, tiny pieces, did deep, deep sequencing on them, and just found that this completely normal skin it's a patchwork of mutation. And many of the mutations we find in there, if you found them in a tumor, you would call that a cancer driver mutation. We find effectively, um, you know, air quotes for a scientific audience, but we, we find cancer mutations in completely normal tissue. And they found this in esophagus. We find this in the endometrium. We find this in blood. Everywhere we look, like normal tissue is really messed up with mutations that if we found them in a cancer, we'd call them a cancer driver. So that tells you that there's much, much more to making a tumor than just these mutations. You know, it's not enough just to be a, a sad cell. You know, lots of our cells are sad. They've yeah. got, they've seen some stuff. They've got some mutations. Yeah. But very, very few of them, maybe one, maybe two in our whole lifetime will emerge as a frank cancer that will, will threaten our life. Yeah. So, and you almost raise that question of not why do some cells become cancerous, but why do many not? Yeah. On the way. yeah, I mean, it's like the world's shittiest lottery. I, I think I describe it as that. It's like so many of your cells are damaged, but each one of us will, you know, if we're lucky, have one, maybe two, maybe three, if you're really unlucky, primary cancers in a lifetime. The odds of that with all the cells in your body, all the cell divisions, the years that you live, the odds of that are infinitesimal. And it made me really look at myself and go like, yeah, body, where <laughs> not only, you know, I look at my arms and like, oh, we're a patchwork of mutation, but like there's some really good stuff going on here that my body is protecting me. Yeah. So, you know, I need to need to help it out to do that. Yeah, and, and I must admit, I was reading this at the same time as uh, Stephen Johnson's book, The Enemy of All Mankind, which is about the emergence of piracy. And you know, he talks about the organisation of pirates quite a lot because you've got a bunch of rebels on one ship. You need actually quite a good organisational structure for, you know, when everyone might kill you. Um, so, and I, I, I thought it was a really interesting parallel between your book and his. Yeah, that was, again, it's this sort of idea that cancers are just a homogenous mass of all the same cells. And, you know, as I said, this idea that, that tumours are incredibly heterogeneous, they, they are 
evolving. We've got to view them more as a population of organisms, you know, that are evolving, changing, responding to their environment. And then you start to see the studies that are like, cancer cells can cooperate. They start to produce public goods for each other. Um, really mind bending phenomenon I discovered um, called uh, vascular mimicry, where we have this idea of tumor angiogenesis as tumors send out signals to blood cells. They're like, we need some nutrients, we need some oxygen, grow the blood vessels. And this has led to a whole field of um, cancer, anti-cancer drugs, which not being that successful, you know? Um, and probably one of the reasons is, turns out that tumor cells can turn themselves into blood vessel cells and plumb into the blood supply. So, you know, cancers are, they are evolving, they are changing, they are, I mean, incredibly clever. One of the, again, one of the, this book is full of mind bending discoveries for me. Um, cancer cells can have sex. So they can fuse, they can do recombination and pop out, if you like, cancer cell babies. Um, this process called kind of parasexual recombination. Um, it is effectively cell sex. And those babies are then resistant to chemotherapy. And when you think about it as an evolutionary system, it's yeah, yeah every, evolu every innovation of evolution that we see in the world, you know, the evolution of sex, the evolution of multicellularity, the differentiation of tissues into different functions. Um, cancer cells are gonna do that because they got a genome and they're mixing it up. Um, yeah. And that's yeah. really, I think that's really important to grasp. Yeah, and the, as you say, that kind of definition of genetics is not just about the DNA that, uh, um, and I remember something we worked on of Aston when, you know, before it was launched and I remember, one of the most fascinating things there was that the, one of the original insights was from someone that used to do surgery on cancers and said, look, when you do surgery on cancers, you realize that they're hot. You study cancer in a, in, a, in a Petri dish and it's not. So suddenly you've lost the insight about one of the ways that cancers you know, do what they do. You needed that insight, that perspective. And I think your, um, your early you know, uh, mindset with you know, sitting the floor above people doing different work is, uh, is is really interesting that I think you use the phrase, you know, this reductionist view of cancer has brought us some stuff, but it might be misleading us on the on the, on the search for cancer, you know, therapeutics as well. Yeah, I'm, you know, I, I mean, the secret is I'm not really a geneticist. I think you know, I might have done a <laughs> genetics course at uni and, uh, yeah. you know, I've worked yeah. on genes and imprinting. Join, join the club, yeah. Yeah, fake, <laughs> fake geneticist over here. Um, but I think that we have really fallen into the trap of genetic reductionism because it's the tools have just been incredible. I mean, you, we've had next generation sequencing, all these incredible tools put into our hands. So of course you're gonna use them. DNA is relatively easy to extract. It's relatively easy to sequence. It's robust, um, you know, all this kind of stuff. So there's been this huge gold rush of people looking at cancer genomes, looking at um, you know, DNA shed into the blood, all this kind of stuff, because we can do it. Now we're starting to get a bit more sophisticated with transcriptomics and all this kind of thing, but the genome is not everything. And also this is an evolving dynamic system. And one of the, one of the companies that I work with is a Swiss company called Bionosis, and they're a, a mass spectrometry proteomics company. And that's pointing out that like, you know, it's not just the genes, genes make proteins and proteins can change and you can have modifications and they can change their shape and all this kind of stuff. Like we need to be thinking about how do we measure phenotype in cancer, not just genotype. Genotype's important, transcriptomics is important, but it's ultimately what is this thing doing mm. and how do we stop that mm. rather than, um, you know, just focusing on the genomics because this connection, I think, between genotype and phenotype is is flaky. Yeah, and there's what you can see, and then there's what you can measure as well. I wonder whether, you know, I love the piece that you had about Zelbaraf, and you know, watching the introduction of what looked like massively compelling evidence, but then also the, the sort of return to normality, and you know, maybe the comment on, um, you know, whether we all convince ourselves that we've developed a cure for cancer when we haven't, you know, we might have, you know, pushed it down by a year or, or, or more. Could, could you a, a, tell us a story of your, you know, that, that observation and, uh, and, you know, what that leads to? 
Yeah, I, I call this sort of the whack-a-mole uh, approach to, to treating cancer. So the, the story of Zelberaf for me starts when I think it was the NCRI conference a few years ago. And I was watching, I think it was Richard Murray, a uh, great scientist who worked a lot on the early discovery of the mutation in BRAF that drives 60% of melanomas, was the foundation for the discovery of Zelberaf, the drug that selectively inhibits these, uh, these mutant receptors. So we were sitting there and he puts up a picture of it's a man, a patient who's just covered in tumours. It's really a distressing image to see. And when I give talks, um, I, you know, I do give a warning about this because this is a very distressing thing to see, particularly if you've ever lost someone to cancer. It's, it's horrible. And then the next picture is this man after, you know, couple of months of treatment with Zelberaf and he looks like a different person you know he's he's plump he's fit he's healthy all these like nodular tumors that were poking out all over his body are gone he's put back on weight he, he looks great and then the next picture you know you saw that's an intake of breath like Wah! and then the next picture is the intake of breath of like <gasps> because you know 15 weeks after that all the tumors are back every single one is back it's back in the same place and that really tells you that these drugs they look incredible but they are effectively enforcing a selective pressure on a tumor you're killing all the cells that are sensitive to the drug you're leaving all the ones that are resistant and so you know we now have this incredible world of targeted therapies and molecular diagnostics and all these things and they do work for some people but they don't work for everyone and in many cases they are they are kicking that can down the road. And one of the examples in the book is um, uh, an acquaintance of mine, a friend of mine really called Christian, who's being still being treated for stage four kidney cancer. Yeah, five, he's still alive five years later and very unexpectedly, but he's been moved from treatment to treatment to treatment to treatment and understands that inevitably at some point the treatment he's on might stop working. And then you just have to hope that there's another one. And if there isn't another one, at that point, you're kind of shit out of luck. Um, and I think that we have fallen into a trap of finding these drugs, just kind of getting them over the line, just showing a bit more efficacy and not thinking about how do we attack the challenge that these cancers do evolve resistance to them um, and not just pay lip service to it, but really address that mm. as, to, as to the challenge. Because the big bucks are there if you can just get your drug over the line. Mm. The big bucks are not there if you can actually really address the problem that these yeah. cancers come back and it's they are not curative yeah no it's, it's interesting because i have had vinay prasad on the podcast uh, last year oh yeah and, you know, <laughs> somewhere in the middle of the 100 miles an hour you know we talk about the the approval process the fda and you know and he's pointed out you know since adju helm was approved for you know not working in alzheimer's that we've had that happen in cancer for a long time now and it's actually increasingly happening that you know just getting over you know a, a small hurdle is enough to, to to get you there because you've got this you know uh, desperate hope for new treatments exactly and the patients want them and the charities want them the researchers want them the companies want them the doctors want them everyone wants them and it's it's a very hard message to to give because you know you don't want to sort of piss on people's chips and say, well, you know, you've got all these fancy treatments, but in the long term, they're not going to help. It's like, well, they're going to help in the short term. And that's always the argument. In the short term, they are going to help. But I think we really need to be paying attention to smarter strategies that are not just another kinase inhibitor, hmm. you know, that we can just get over the line because we can just show a bit more efficacy, a bit more not even overall survival, just a bit more progression-free survival than the last guy. Um, yeah. I think that really needs to stop. But as, as Vinny said, and I, I listened a lot to his podcast when I was researching the book, you know, if you have a, a dad who says, well, son, I'll, I'll buy you a car if you get a D in your A-levels, <laughs> well, the kid's not going to get an A. <laughs> There's no incentive. Yeah. All the yeah. incentive structures are wrong. Um, yeah. And that's no one in particular's fault, but it's a, a big challenge. Yeah, it's, it's another tragedy of the commons, I think, in, in, in that sense, a sort of behavioural one. Um, but that, um, you know, I, I want to also draw a parallel with, say, the COVID pandemic that uh, I think you point out in the book, is it 90% of all human cancers are in the over 50s? You know, so it's, it's almost, a, it's, it's not a disease of ageing, but it's a disease that we're seeing because of ageing, a bit like the dementias, you know. Um, could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so this was the sort of the 
interesting theory that I encountered, which is this idea of like adaptive oncogenesis, which is not just saying, okay, curious observation, like cancer is more common in elderly people. And there's this idea that um, cancer is more common in elderly people because the older you are, the more time you've had for typos, you know, mutations to accumulate in the cells of your body and something's going to go wrong. But that's when you look at it, okay, it's a bit more sophisticated than that because the graph of cancer incidence by age is not a straight line. It's not this kind of, you know, 45 degree line straight up, which is what you would expect if mutational load accumulates steadily through life and is relevant uh, relative to cancer risk. That's what you'd expect. It's not what we see. Also, like the times in your life when you have most cell proliferation, when there's most chances of things going wrong, are when you're younger because you're growing, you're proliferating loads of cells. Uh, and we don't see massive you know, incidents of cancer in, in children. And children's cancers, we now know, are more developmental issues. They're kind of cells that have been blocked in the wrong stage of development and gone off on their own weird pathway. Um, so when you actually think about it, it's like there's something going on here because the graph is basically pretty flat until you get to about 60 and then it goes up. So this tells you that not only are you more likely to get cancer when you're older, but there is something protective going on in younger tissues. And so is that the immune system? Is that the integrity of your tissues? Is this inflammation? Is this just like the processes of aging? Um, that kind of stuff. And this is basically evolutionarily hardwired into us because this is a biological process. Um, and there's a guy in uh, Colorado called James de Gregory. He's written a fantastic book called uh, Adaptive Oncogenesis that I'd really recommend reading that goes into a lot more depth about this. But like, there's something that humans have evolved to be protected from cancer when we're younger. And then once you get to 60, I mean, I guess evolution kind of gives up on you, uh, which is, you know, as a woman kind of crashing through my 40s, it's not a fun thing to, no, to realize. I'm a bit closer than you are, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but there's this deep, biology here yeah. and we need to not ignore it um, we need to understand it mm. and then what is it that keeps young tissues healthy um, is it about tissue integrity and then how can we mimic that or, or restore that or know how to preserve that because even if we can push the incidence of cancer five years 10 years 15 years further down the road that will ex extend human health span massively um, you know, if you're not developing cancer when you're 65, but when you're 85, you know, that's that's a big difference. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, you, you touch on this all as well that you know how little we focus on prevention and how much we focus on, you know, cure and treatment and therapeutics. Yeah, oh boy, <laughs> that's because prevention's hard. Mm. Um, I mean, you know, we do know what what behaviours. A contribute to a lower risk of cancer we know what behaviors and things contribute to higher risks of certain cancers and yeah it's the boring stuff it's don't smoke take exercise don't be too overweight eat a healthy diet don't burn yourself in the sun don't drink too much booze you know the the boring things but what we don't really know in a lot of cases is why and the one i think is really the two i think are really interesting are um body fat and physical activity we know that physical activity is protective against a whole bunch of things, including cancer. Don't really know why. Um, my, my bet, uh, as with most things, is it something to do with inflammation um, and tissue health overall. But yeah, if we can understand what is actually keeping tissues healthy and controlling the rebel cells, well, our bodies are full of these like cells that are damaged mm. and they don't go awry because the society is kind of tight around them mm. um, so what is it that keeps tissue healthy as scientists we tend to ask what's gone wrong we're always asking mm. what's gone wrong why did it go wrong mm. because it's much more challenging to ask well why did it not go wrong why did something not happen why did we have a near miss mm. um, you know if an aer airplane investigators do this you know you investigate the near misses as well as the accidents, because it's in the near misses that you also learn. Yes, 
yeah, that, that famous picture of the plane with the, with yeah. the <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, oh, let's let's reinforce the bits that got shot in the planes that came back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we see that a lot with our industry, right? I mean, that that, that that's what we get is repeat behavior of uh, of successes, and, and I think, as you say, you know, we we you know we know how to cure cancer in some cancers in some people, but um, loads in mice we're really good at curing cancer yeah. in mice. Yeah. Oh boy, oh, that's yeah. another point as well with the the age issue is that we do so many cancer experiments on young male mice and like who gets cancer older people uh, at the very least mm. we should be at least paying attention to doing modeling doing preclinical research in old tissues yeah. but again that's expensive keeping mice for a year is expensive yeah. <laughs> rather than keeping yeah. them for six weeks um, the fantastic podcast that was into Peter Atier and uh, Steve Austin talking about, uh, um, you, you know, uh, a lot of things. But one of the things that I never knew was just how odd the mice that we use are, you know, and how distinctly odd and unusual these mice have been. You know, they were they came out of a competition that apparently there's a, such a thing as a mouse beauty competition, which these things were derived from and how unlike humans they are. And I remember, you know, I've done some work with a dog cancer company in, in San Francisco. And one of the beautiful things they said to me was the interesting thing about dogs who get cancer is that they get it despite their intact immune systems. You know, whereas the mice that we give cancer to don't have intact immune systems, but we think we're learning something from, from, from what we're doing. Yeah. No more mice, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And it, and it seems like an odd thing to believe that any of it is useful for dementia or for cancer or any of those other things um so you know you're still optimistic you know you, you know th there's an optimism that is written all the way through the book about you know uh, ways that we could be thinking about you know cancer drug development can you give us your sort of top three <laughs> tips well so that, so there's the sort of there's the personal side of it because i do i do often get asked like well based on everything that you know and everything that you've written about you know how should we think about like what, what should I do to protect myself from cancer and like, my first thing is well don't be adding to your mutational burden uh, we know things that cause mutations and you know, we've got the work of people like the the team at the Sanger Institute doing the mutographs project where they're just finding out like what damages DNA how does it damage it it's like okay we know a bunch of things so don't add to your mutational burden um, and then the second part of that is do the stuff that we know maintains tissue health. And that is the kind of the boring stuff, like exercise and all of those kind of things. So like keep your tissues young and beautiful, don't add to the mutations. But in terms of um, cancer treatments and cancer therapy, I mean, some of the things I'm most excited about are the people who are taking these more evolutionarily informed approaches to cancer. So, you know, starting with um, actually understanding cancers. So um, this is work of people like Carlo Maley and the, the consortium that he pulled together to go, okay, can we actually, looking at the genomics of tumours, looking at the environment of tumours, looking at the diversity, the heterogeneity of tumours, can we start to classify them on an evolutionary axis as well as a genetic, purely a genetic one? So this is moving away from like, just what are the target mutations in there? So overall, what is this cancer like? Is it sort of flourishing with diversity, in which case you've probably got some problems, or is it relatively sparse? You've only got a couple of driver mutations, a couple of cell populations, in which case that's a really good bet for you know, targeted therapy and, and minimal therapy. Um, but then moving on from that, there are some really interesting ideas that take evolutionary strategies that are used in other places. So pest control in farming and agriculture it assumes that resistance is going to arise. You can't eradicate every pesticide-resistant cricket from a field, or um, the diamondback moth is the, the best example. You know, we can't eradicate them. We have to accept that they're there. And then you have to balance populations of cells. You accept that there are sensitive cells and resistant cells, and you have to work out how to balance them out because one will suppress the other. It's like kind of rival gangs. It's like they're both gangs but one's going to suppress the other. And usually it's the, the drug sensitive cells are fitter because you, in many cases being drug resistant comes with a, a fitness cost. So there are these strategies, particularly being pioneered by people like Bob Gattenby at the Moffitt Cancer Institute down in Florida. But these are increasingly spreading out around the world. These ideas of you know, giving people cycles of therapy that suppress the sensitive cells 
and then let the cancers grow back. So you treat and then you stop treating. But you have to do it in a way that's informed by knowledge of the tumour burden at the time and the kind of diversity, the genomic diversity of what you've got. Because there's been things like metronomic chemo approaches where it's just like treat, stop, treat, stop, treat, stop. But you need to treat at the right time depending on the burden that you've got in the body. And so that, that's the idea of you could sort of maintain a population of tumour that's not going to cause someone a problem and maintain that for potentially years. And they've shown that in prostate cancer. There are other things where, okay, if you hit these populations you've got at the right time in the right way, then that's an extinction strategy. And that is potentially curative. And we need to figure out how to find these strategies in an informed way. And that is where the genomics and the proteomics and all these things will come together to help understand what are the populations of cancer cells in a patient's body? How do we either play them off against each other? How do we hit them at the right time in the right place? Um, so I think that that is, is very exciting. We already know it works in things like children's leukemia. You know, the, the strategy that was basically come up by accident, by trial and error by Sydney Farber you know, 50 years ago is an extinction strategy. It's hitting cell populations in specific times with specific drugs, with specific modes of action. But it turns out that that does match the kind of evolutionary journey of these leukemia cells because they're a relatively simple population and they only tend to do the same kind of things. Mm. So if we can do that on a personalized basis to understand these much more complex solid tumors in adults and, and more complex uh, cancers in adults, then that I think is very, very exciting. And that's where we need, you know, we need all the omics, we need the AI, we need the systems biology, we need evolutionary thinkers, we need mathematicians. One lovely idea is, um, you know, getting things like gamers involved to just try and play different strategies uh, as kind of simulations to come up with different ways of targeting these cancers. So I, I think it's an incredibly exciting future. Yeah, and uh, you draw a parallel with, you know, climate modeling and a bunch of other things which are, you know, complex ecosystems rather than just a, you know, single focus on, you know, making the room warmer at the moment, it, uh, which is what we do. Um, and then I mean, on the climate thing, I did, uh, yeah, there's a famous picture of like some guy in, I think it may be Florida again, trying to like shoot a gun into a hurricane. <laughs> and that's really sort of how I feel sometimes about the uh, the concept that you can, completely stop cancer with just one targeted therapy with one silver bullet it's like well maybe yeah. some you can but most you're you're just firing a bullet into this complicated system yeah and it's, yeah, it's not gonna do much yeah. disruption yeah i was reading something about the there's a project going on in scotland at the moment some guy rewilding i think a danish billionaire rewilding a huge part of scotland and part of it was getting rid of the deer and it seems like a counterintuitive thing to get rid of deer, which occur naturally. But he's saying, well, look, you know, we've got way too many. And actually, they tend to destroy everything when they're there. So a part of this has to be. And he talked about this as a cathedral project. It's a sort of 300-year project rather than a three- or 30-year project. And I kind of like that idea that you've got to begin some stuff in order to, in, in order to get somewhere beautiful. Yeah. You, I'd highly recommend uh, venison Wellington if you want to eat eat the products of <laughs> too many deer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, you, you, you sort of close look, looking at the uh, sort of reality of humans and cancer, and the, you know when it fails, and you know that we don't treat the disease of cancer as, as well as we should. You know, you draw parallels with Atul Gawande's, you know, uh, book about mortality as well. Um, you know, could you tell us how you sort of summarize? all of what's gone before? I, it's, I think it's trying to make peace is probably not quite the right phrase because this is, this is an enemy. Like this mm. is something that, that kills the people we love. It's horrendous. It's destructive. It leaves everyone who experiences cancer personally is changed by it. Um, the people that we, we love and we lose, it, it's just horrific. So we should never give up trying to, beat it but what I think we have to do is stop thinking of it in this reductive way as something that, that's alien that's separate that we can just almost like take out cut out box out and fire bullets at it's like it's integral to human biology it is integral to multicellularity it's always going to be with us um I genuinely uh, I'm, I'm happy to you know if people want to take me to task on this but I genuinely don't think we will be in a world where no one will ever get cancer. 
Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think that's realistic. Mm -hmm. What I want to be is in a world where everyone who is given a diagnosis of cancer says, right, we know what to do about you. We know what to do. We can look at what you've got. We can look at what these cells are up to. We can look at where they think they're going, what they're likely to do and have the best strategy for you. Not just based on the genomics, but based on the actual phenotypes of the cells that are living in the environment of you and your body as to what we can do about it to control this population that has started to get out of control. Um, and I think that's very exciting, but it's, it's a very human, it is a human thing. It's always uh, it's scary writing a book about cancer because you know patients are going to read it. You know, people are going to read it who have lost loved ones. You, you know, many people, myself included, will know people where they were treated, it seemed to be successful, and then the cancer came back and then there was nothing we could do. Mm. And, you know, it's a hard read to know that maybe we haven't been looking in the right place all the time. But, you know, the best time to change something, if you couldn't change it before, is to change it now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and actually, when I was looking through the, um, you know, the reviews, I think you should be, you know, commended because clearly a lot of patients have read this and found it a way into understanding what's going on and what they're being told and uh, and let's put it in perspective and uh, uh you know congratulate on the writing style which makes it accessible for someone that doesn't have a you know deep uh you know oncology uh perspective um have you got I another mean, one in you uh, <laughs> uh yeah so the yeah this book kind of took it out of me um this one because i i pitched the idea for this book quite a long time ago when i first went freelance in 2016 when I left Cancer Research UK and in between getting the pitch accepted you know actually selling the book in uh, and having to deliver it a lot changed in my life um, partly I set up my own communications consultancy first create the media and we started to get more and more work um, we work with companies in the life sciences we help them tell their stories to the world um, and do all that kind of stuff and suddenly it was like, oh, my goodness, I have to write a book at the same time as trying to grow a company and, and keep keep the ship afloat. So um, I don't know if I have another book like this in me. Um, I'm incredibly proud of this one. Um, and I, it is really nice to see the reviews from cancer patients, because I think one of the things that struck me and what I wanted to get across was we can get very blamey about cancer when someone when someone's diagnosed, they always you know, one of the first questions is like, well, why me? Why, why did I, was it something I did? Or, or people go like, well, they did smoke. So <laughs> like, lots of people smoke and don't get cancer. So, um, but it's really making people realize this is, this is deep within us. And, you know, there are things we do that help. There are things we do that don't help. What can you say about any individual situation? Um, and, and taking away that element of like, well, it must have been something you did. Yeah. I think it's yeah. been really helpful. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think I it's slightly sarcastically posted a moral exemption certificate for people who, you know, think it's okay if people who get COVID were unvaccinated or people who think that, you know, people who die or are obese or whatever. It's uh it, it, it's an odd perspective. And I think you're right to take that that that, that view that this is a you know, there but by the grace of God, uh, you know, go I. Um Fantastic. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about your kind of, you know, your, your day job? You mentioned the, the agency uh, be before we close. Are we keen to, you know, have you describe, you know, what you do for a living? Yeah. So, um, so when I left Cancer Research UK in 2016, that was when my first book came out, and I was like, yep, yeah, I'm going to be a freelance writer, broadcaster. So I, I did all of that stuff, and then just got more and more organisations coming to me saying, wow you really get the science, you can really communicate it, we need help. And then more and more of that coming and me realizing like, I need help um, and started to build a team around me. I found some really incredible people. Um, first of whom is my, my chief operating officer, Sarah Hazel, who I actually recruited when I was at CRUK and is the single most organized and impressive person I've ever met. Uh, and we started to build this little team. And, and like before I knew it, we were running an agency and we've been working with just some incredible clients. Um, Probably the one that most people might have heard of is Zoe, who do the Zoe COVID uh, study, which is the phone app that you can just log your health. And it, it's genuinely changed the face of the pandemic. We found new symptoms. We've been able to monitor in near real time the rates of COVID across the UK. So me and my team, um, we were already working with Zoe 
for their precision nutrition work. And we signed a new contract at the beginning of 2020, just thinking, oh, we're going to, you know, be writing about blood glucose and all these kind of things. And then the team built this app literally in a weekend. Within a week, there were a million users and we were like, okay, we are now supporting the comms for what's now the world's biggest COVID study. Yeah. Um, so we've been writing, um, supporting them with their, their press releases and, and writing the, the content that comes in the app and all that kind of stuff. So that's been a pretty wild journey. But yeah, we've worked, we've worked with some really amazing companies, really big ones, really small startups. Um, I was delighted to see a company called uh, By Victrix, who's run by an incredible woman called Tiffany Thorne Daniels. They're working on a new type of uh, antibody treatment for cancer. And I worked with her last year to help her kind of un- like figure out like, what's the story you're going to tell? How do you engage investors? And they secured some funding last year and they've just listed on the London Stock Exchange today. And I'm just it's just delightful to, to you know, support an incredible founder to tell her story and, and go on that journey. So Fantastic. that's, you know, from the yeah. biggest companies, we work with really big companies, we work with uh, really small companies and institutions and organisations, and each one is is a lot of fun. Yeah, and um, among all that, do you get time to read? Because I always ask people for their book recommendations um, before we sign off. Wow. Um, so... I will confess I don't have a lot of time to read and I'm one of these sort of Puritans that if I if I have time to read I should read business books or informative Mm. educational books so I've recently been reading a lot of Terry Pratchett and all the Philip Pullman (laughs) trilogies just Mm -hmm. as a bit of wonderful escapism and sort of Agatha Christie books just to just to get out of it. I'm not surprised uh, that there would be uh, parallel to the day job rather than uh, rather than deep in it but uh, you know it sounds like you've always pulled together threads from fiction science fiction and other places to support your work so um if people want to find out more about you cat i know you've got one of the blue ticks on twitter you know could you tell us tell everyone, tell, tell everyone how to find you <laughs> uh, you can find me on twitter i am at cat k-a-t underscore arnie a-r-n-e-y you can connect with me on linkedin i'm always happy to chat with people especially if you're interested in how can you tell your stories about the life sciences to the world um and also uh, you can come and find more about first create the media at first create the media.com and that's where Fantastic. we are and the book uh, book's got to oh yeah up, rebel uh, cell yeah. That's why yeah. we're here. The book Rebel Cell yes. uh, is available from all good booksellers. It just came out in paperback at the beginning of August. Uh, I've got a little website for the book. It's rebelcellbook.com, but it's available from, from all good and all evil booksellers. Fantastic. Kat, it's been uh, as much fun as I thought it would be. Uh, thank you for joining me. <laughs> it's been a delight. Thank you. Thank you.